Alright folks, today we're going to take a look at Game of Thrones, the board game. This is the second edition version from Fantasy Flight. They had the, the first edition version, which had some pretty significant differences. I'm not entirely sure what they all were because I didn't play that edition of the game. But most of what people had a problem with with that game supposedly was fixed with the second edition. And that's the edition that I'm going to review today. Now, uh... As the name suggests, this is based on the Song of Ice and Fire books and the game of... not. It's, it's based primarily off the books, not the series. This has been out since before the series was actually on, I believe, or right around the same time. Uh, I'm going to try my very, very best to not give away any kind of spoilers about the book other than just the base narrative, um, which isn't too hard with this game because it doesn't go too much into the actual nitty-gritty details of all the characters but nevertheless if you absolutely do not want to know anything about the show if you're new to it if you just don't uh, if you just want to discover all that on your own you have been warned you should probably just sit this review out until you have experienced more of the world of westeros uh so what is this game well this is a very uh deterministic uh area control war game I mean, it's, it's tough to describe it. I don't play a lot of different games like this, so I'm not down with all of the different terminology, but basically, rather than this being a character-driven game, much like the, character, uh, the, the Game of Thrones card game, also from Fantasy Flight, this game is more about a, a broad sweeping overview of the, the War of Kings, the, the, or the Clash of Kings, the war over Westeros between all the different uh, warring factions and the different families. Each player takes control of one of these different families. It goes up to six players. So you have, the, let's see if I can name them all. The Starks, the Lannisters, the Baratheons, the Greyjoys, uh, House Martell, and House Tyrell. I think that's all. I think I got all that right. Each player takes control of a different one of those houses, and you just go to war with the other houses, trying to take over different lands, trying to take over uh, castles, which count as power and also count as victory points for the end of the game. First person to 10 castles is the winner. There's not a lot of luck in this game whatsoever. Uh, the only luck is that you have to deal with the, the different wildling tribes who might attack from the wall. Uh, you are just moving around your units, trying to make alliances and having to eventually break alliances and so on. Um, so it's a very, it's been compared to Diplomacy, if you're familiar with that game at all, but with, of course, with a much more thematic experience. But I don't want to go on too long about this in my intro. Let's just go ahead and do an overview of the game. Try to make it as brief as possible because there's a lot of moving parts here. Then we're going to come back and I'll tell you what I think. All right, Game of Thrones, the board game, is a very long, complex game with a lot of little intricacies, so I don't have time to give you a full overview. I'm just gonna give you a broad, sweeping, general view of the game. Now, this is the map of Westeros, as depicted in the movie, I mean, I'm sorry, in the TV show and the books and such, depicting all the different regions that take place for the majority of the uh, Game of Thrones and Song of Ice and Fire saga. They're all broken down into regions, and as you can see, I've already set up the game board for all the different starting houses. So uh, each player is, at the beginning of the game is going to choose a different house. Depending on how many players you have, you may not be able eligible to use every house, but the game is really ideal with six players. You'll take one of your screens indicating uh, this one is for House Stark, for instance. And on the back, it will tell a little cheat sheet with all your different setup and what some of the different tokens do. And it will tell you where to start off with your starting forces. Uh, you have knights, you have footmen, which are just different ground units which will occupy space on the board. You can also eventually get siege engines, which will also be very powerful things for sieging castles. Uh, and you have boats, which are able, of course, to move out on the water to different uh, air, uh, ocean regions. Now you also get uh, these order tokens which are going to be used on the game board during one of the phases when you're giving orders to all the troops you have, the boats, the footmen and such, uh, which are going to let you do different things. Now, if you play one of the Consolidate and Power tokens, which are the crowns, you're actually going to be able to gain these Power tokens, which you'll also start the game off with some as well. And these are going to be used for bidding, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, you can use these Support tokens, which will give support to either another region you control that is involved in combat, or to any other player's region if you want to help them out, because the game is uh, very much about alliances and helping people um, if, if only to gain uh, something for yourself as well. Then you have the marching order tokens, which are going to actually let you march your troops into another region, possibly resulting in combat. And finally, you have the raid tokens, which are going to let you cancel out someone else's support orders or consolidate power orders and uh, generally make their lives miserable. Now, some of these tokens have stars on them, you might have noticed, and that actually, you don't always have access to the star ones. I'll get to that in a moment. 
Each player also has a, a small deck of cards that is particular to their house and is going to, this is all used for combat purposes. Basically when you get into combat you'll play one of these cards together with the troops that you have in order to try and win and uh, generally uh, either defend yourself or uh, win whatever territory you're contesting for. So for instance, this is the Stark deck. So we have Roos Bolton, uh, you have the great John Umber, you have Rob Stark, Sir Roderick Cassell, Eddard Stark, the Blackfish, and Caitlin Stark. And they all, uh, or most of them also have special abilities as well. So for instance, Caitlin says, if you have a defense order token in the embattled area, its value is doubled. Um, some of them have icons, which means different things. So Eddard Stark has two swords. This means that, you know, normally when you win a combat, uh, and this is their strength value that they add to the battle, uh, just as a point of reference. But usually if you win a combat, all it means is that your opponent has to retreat his troops. And as long as they have a place to retreat to, then they just move out and nothing bad happens to them. If they don't have a place to retreat to, then they get obliterated. But um, even if they do retreat, if there are sword icons on this card, then they're gonna take a number of casualties equal to the number of sword icons they have. That means they actually use, lose units. But these fortification icons will cancel those out. So there's a lot of give and take of try figuring out and what the way you play cards is that each player chooses one it's public information all the time through the game which cards you have available but you'll each choose one then flip simultaneously and at that point you don't know what your opponent is necessarily going to pick and um, then you'll be able to refresh all of your cards at a certain point but that's just a little quickie of how the combat works in this game now there a lot of this game is bidding and there's two major things that you bid on one is the influence tracks over here you have the iron throne the fiefdoms and the king's court and there will be a phase in the game where you'll take the available power tokens that you have uh, particular to your house and do a blind bidding for each of the different tracks. And when I say blind bidding, you will secretly choose from behind your little DM screen here as many tokens as you want, close them in your fist, and when everyone's ready, everybody reveals. Whoever has the most power tokens at that point wins the track. And uh, if there's any ties, well, that has to do with the Iron Throne track, which we'll get to in a second. Even if you lose the bid, unfortunately, you also lose all the power that you bid as well. Well, you can get power back mostly by using the Consolidate Power Order Tokens. So if you win the Iron Throne track and you're at the head, like I said, you get to break all ties. Usually it has to do with bidding and some other certain circumstances, but not combat. If you win the Fiefdom track, you get to break all ties in combat throughout the game, but also you gain access, at least for that round, to the Valyrian Steel Sword. Now, you can use this by flipping it over at any point during that game round to give yourself or anyone a plus one to combat. For the King's Court track, uh, a couple different things happen. If you're at the head of it, first off, you get this Raven token, which you can flip over to do either one of two things. You can either look at the top card of the Wilding deck, which I haven't explained yet, but that could be very important. Or you can, after your order tokens have all been placed on the board and then revealed for the turn, you can then remove and swap one of them for one of your available order tokens. So when you place these order tokens out on the board uh, during that phase, it's possible that you're making a move that will be countered by your opponent or it's not ideal based on what your opponent plays. And by having this and using this ability, you can make that change and possibly save yourself. But you also gain another thing. Now, this is the only track on the board where the top three spots have little star icons next to them. And that has to do with the stars on the order tokens. Depending on who wins that track from spots one through four, you will have access and be allowed to use a certain amount of your star tokens. If you're at the top of the track, you can use three of your star orders. If you are at the bottom of the next spot, you can use another, you can also use three, then two, and then one. The people in the fifth and sixth spots do not get to use any of their star orders. So that can be very important. Now, now next to that track is a supply track and the supply track will ebb and flow but it's very important because it means that you can only have a certain amount of troops on different regions of the board. The more supplies you have, the more troops you can have in different areas in the regions that you control. Then you have the round tracker here, and then you have the victory tracker. Now the victory tracker is, in the game is gonna be won by whoever can acquire seven castles before the other players do. So you'll constantly move up as you take control of different castles on the board. But the game also ends if you get to round 10 of the track and no one has been a clear victor yet. At that point, whoever has the most castles is the winner. Now that's just a very broad overview of the different things you can do in the game. Uh, there's also a couple of other things having to do with cards, which are the wildling tracks of the game rounds and the optionals, I believe they're called either Winds of War or Tides of War cards. Now the wildling track, each round there will be a phase where 
this is where more of the bidding comes in on the game. Uh, the Wildlings are attacking from the north, and all of the peoples, the different houses, the six houses down in Westeros have to muster forces to try to hold them back. But what you do is you bid power to try and see who is going to commit the most of their forces and power to try and hold them back. You could bid nothing if you want, or you can try to bid as, you know, be the one who bids the most. Now, if you bid the most, there's a possibility that whatever card gets flipped over from the Wildling deck, you're going to get a bonus for that. Or if you bid the least, there's possible there will be a penalty, or if you bid nothing. So it's it's very important. to uh, It's kind of random to try and uh, guess what's going to happen if you want to be the one who spends the most power. But if you spend power here, you're not going to have power for the other tracks. It's just a decision you're going to have to make. So some examples of these cards. Um, here we go. We have the Mammoth, Ri Ma Mammoth Riders. Um, the lowest bidder destroys three of his units anywhere. Everyone else destroys two of their units everywhere. But the highest bidder may retrieve a house card of his choice from his house card discard pile. Um, just another example. Let me find a cool one here. We have the Crow Killers. Uh, the lowest bidder replaces all of his knights with available footmen, which means his knights are essentially downgraded to footmen. Any knight unavailable to be replaced unable to be replaced is destroyed everyone else replaces two of their knights with available footmen any knight unable to be replaced is destroyed the highest bidder may immediately replace up to two of his footmen anywhere with available knights so you never know what card is going to come out there's not that many cards there's about uh, 10 cards in the deck but it could be good it could be bad now as we go through the different uh stages of the game as well you have these cards which will be flipped over uh the different game rounds which will have a universal effect on the game for good or for worse so uh let's now this is the last days of summer card this just means nothing happens uh but in the mustering card is drawn you can recruit new units and strongholds and castles so if you control strongholds and castles on the board uh you may then muster units which means you can create new footmen and such there uh, you have a throne of blades. The holder of the iron throne token chooses whether everyone updates their supply, then reconciles armies. Everyone musters units, or this card has no effect. And the cards will be different depending on what stack that you're in. You have the supply card, which everyone hopes and prays that they get. Uh, adjust your supply track, reconcile armies, and so on. So it's uh, it can be a little bit random. You never know what's going to come out. You're hoping that the card like supply or mustering armies comes out when you need it, but you just don't know. Now, the last thing I'll talk about is this optional supplement, which is, I believe, called the Tides of War. You, you have to decide whether you're going to use this at the beginning or not. You have to either go all in or all out. What this does is adds a little bit of randomness to the game because combat is pretty deterministic. You know which cards your opponent has, and it's just a matter of outthinking them and figuring out what card, which of their house cards they're going to play. You already see on the board how many troops they have compared to yours and what your support tokens are. So there's not a lot of luck involved. It's just trying to outthink your opponent. But... The Tides of War cards will add some randomness. Each player draws a card, and it supplements their army. So here it's plus zero to their defense, but they're going to you're going to lose a troop at the end because there, there's a skull icon. This one will give you plus two to your defense. Um, there's also ones for combat. So this one also plus one, but it's going to kill one of the your opponent's troops. This one will give you plus one. But it's going to, I'm sorry, I've been saying defense, it should be combat, but plus one to combat and fortification, so it'll protect you from one of those sword icons. Uh, some people like to use these, some people don't. It may add too much randomness to your game. But if you do have the Valyrian Steel and you don't like the card that you draw, you can flip it over if you haven't already used it to draw another card. So that is just a very, very, very fast run through of the Game of Thrones game. You're trying to get as many castles and strongholds as you can before your opponents do, or just have the and try to get to seven, or just have the most by the end of the tenth round. Constant back and forth, building alliances, negotiating, backstabbing your opponents. That's basically Game of Thrones. Uh, same as the book, same as the TV show, that's the board game. Well, Fantasy Flight Games has made a name for itself, uh, not just for having big, grandiose games with a lot of pieces and a lot of Ameritragic games, but also having games with a lot of theme. And I think that the Game of Thrones board game, uh, even more so than the card game version of this, 
definitely succeeds in that. Now, it's an interesting thing because in a game like Game of Thrones, it's or I'm sorry, uh, uh, the show Game of Thrones or the books A Song of Ice and Fire, it's very, very character driven. Um, you know, everyone's got their favorite characters and you're living, even though there is like this broad sweeping epic going around them, if it wasn't for the intimate views of each of the different characters that we have, the show and the books would not be what it is. And how do you make that translate into a board game? Well, you do that by not worrying about that at all. What this game is focused on, like I mentioned in the beginning, is just a sweeping overview of the epic that's happening uh, to all of these characters of the war between the houses. Now, obviously, because this is a game and you never know who's going to win, it's not going to follow the books exactly. I mean, you could be House Greyjoy and win this game and just wipe everyone else off the map. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that's not a spoiler to anyone that the Greyjoys aren't doing that well but in, the, in any of the series. But, um, you know, so there there is that. But it doesn't, but that's, that's fine. I mean, you still get the feeling of the show as far as this war between the houses because of all the different elements. You have, you do have the character cards which you use for combat, which... Uh, each have different powers and different stats and try to make them somewhat thematic to the character themselves. I'm not sure if it always succeeds in that regard. Uh, like, you know, the Red Viper having a lot of power and or really, ca you know, causing a lot of troops to be killed. Um, things like that. But, you know, that doesn't matter so much as just uh, having the houses themselves warring against each other. The addition of the, the wildlings attacking from the north at the wall, that's a very cool thing. Um, and also the vying for power uh, as far as vying for each of the the different stations, like uh, being having the Iron Throne or being the Master of Coin or the the, uh, the Master of Ravens, things like that, uh, all really give you the feeling of the show, and it works really well in that regard. The map looks very good. I'm not a big fan of the different components for each of the houses, like the boats and the, the units look like the you know. I don't know. I guess they didn't want to spend that much to make more intricate pieces. I'm sure a lot of people have tricked out their games to look better than these pieces do, but it's it's a somewhat minor complaint. Um, the rule book is kind of a bear. I mean, it's just a, a bit. But then again, there's a lot to this game, so I don't know. Fantasy Flight is known for having pretty dense rule books. I don't think this is an exception, but I don't know what you could do because there's a lot of details to cover here. And please don't take my overview as any kind of rules explanation because I'm sure I miss a lot of stuff. But what do I actually feel about this game? I am not the biggest fan of it. And it's certainly not because I don't like Game of Thrones. I love Game of Thrones. I was pre-inclined to want to like this game, but there's a few things that really hold this game back for me. First off, I mentioned that it's very cool that you have these the, the bidding process and the vying for power for all of these tracks. Um, but I also think that for me, that's a huge downside to the game, mechanically speaking. I am not a fan of blind bidding in the first place, and the blind bidding in this game is extremely harsh. It's not the easiest thing in the world in this game to get power, which is essentially the money that you use to bid with. And um, losing a bid is just devastating. I mean, losing your power that you've so, uh, uh, tried so hard to accumulate. Some people love that tension. Some people love the bluffing and the, the misdirection, but... For me, it's not something I've ever been a fan with. I think there's other bidding games that do it well, like the game Infamy, where you pay to play, but you also get the money back that you bid on it if you don't win the bid. That would have been a better system to me, um, because in this game, it doesn't feel as thematic because you're giving up all of your power. I mean, you, you lose bid for power, and it could make you powerless, literally, and I don't know that that makes a lot of sense. So I'm not a fan of that aspect of it. Um, as far as the actual gameplay itself, now, a lot of people like the fact that there's no luck. I mean, if there had just been random dice rolling, this would be a little better than Risk. So I'm okay with that, but the game never felt that exciting to me. Um, it's very, very time-consuming and tedious putting out all the different chips to indicate your troop movements and what your troops are going to do, the raiding and the, the moving and attacking and things like that. And while it's a neat idea, it never felt that exciting to me. Maybe there should have been some sort of a uh, little bit of random chance with fighting, a little more risk prevention, things like that. Um, it also can be a mean game. Now, I said in the beginning that a lot of people compare this to a more thematic, richer, and deeper diplomacy. I've never played diplomacy, but I know it doesn't make a lot of friends. And as the person who taught me this game has said several times when I played it with him, in order to win this game, you have to make alliances, and then you have to break those alliances. That will happen with every person that plays this game. And uh, one of the games that I played, I came close to winning, and that is the only reason, because I had a very close alliance with someone who was far too innocent and trusting, and eventually I just, in one fell swoop after someone else had weakened him down, I decimated him. 
and took over his places of power, his castles, and got within a hair's breadth of winning, except, and this leads me to another fault in the game, the person in control of the Starks was completely unmolested for the whole game, which I think happens in a lot of games. I consider the, the North to be the Australia of this game, if you want to use a risk reference. And it's just very, very, they have a very, very good uh, starting point in place of power. And so I'm not saying that's the only reason I lost. I lost, I lost. I mean, I, I, I made some suboptimal moves, I'm sure. Uh, but nevertheless, that is an issue. Uh, the wildling attack, I mean, that goes hand-in-hand -hand with the bidding as well. I think it's neat that everyone should contribute, and if you don't contribute, then something bad might happen to you. And if you contribute the most, then something good might happen to you. But, I don't know, the randomness of the cards, it just feels like another added layer of stuff that could just totally screw you over and cripple a player more than a player who maybe just doesn't even do anything. I mean, I don't know. You're giving up a lot of power, not getting a lot in return, and you don't even know if you're getting a lot in return or anything in return. So that can be kind of brutal. Um, I don't know. It, and the game is long. That's probably my biggest issue with it, is that for what it is, I want it to be an exciting war game, and it just goes on for so long. I know that a lot of actual war games go on for days, but I wanted this, the Game of Thrones game, to be more exciting, more tension-filled, more, you know, just hanging on the edge of your seat, but it's just far too long for that. It's too long between turns, waiting for people to resolve things. Um, I do like the combat mechanic, because it's actually a mechanic that was used uh, in somewhat of a different way in the game Comet, which I really love, but not nearly as exciting as it's implemented in Comet along with the rest of that game, much, much longer. So, uh, I don't know. I'm probably in the minority of people that disliking this game. And I'm not, I'm not gonna say it's an awful game by any means. I would give it, for me, personally, it's a middle-of-the-road game. I would probably play it again if there was a lot of people in my group that wanted to play it, and I really didn't have anything else going on in games I desperately needed to play for a review or anything like that. Um, because there is some good elements to it, and you definitely can get into it, the camaraderie of the people at the table, especially if everyone is Game of Thrones fans. The references will just be flying back and forth. Uh, but it's just too long for what it is and doesn't give me enough feeling of excitement. There's other games I could play that I think would be better for that. I'm sad to say I have not played Twilight Imperium, which is sitting on my shelf for months and months and months off camera here. Um, and maybe I won't like that for the same reasons because it's too long and there's just not enough going on. But uh, for this, I would probably play it again, but not that willingly. It's just not exciting enough for me. Um, but I am happy that so many people love it and that Game of Thrones did get a satisfactory, to, and more than satisfactory for a lot of people, board game, because that is a great series of books, and the TV show is great. You should check out both. So that's the, that's the only uh, really, uh, really positive recommendation I can give in this review. My name is Nick. This has been Board Game Brawl, and I'm reminding you to get out there and game every day and every way. Take care.